Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Georgi Derlugian. Uh, many of you know that I'm professor of sociology. Uh, here, you might wonder then, you know, what the heck I'm doing with all these stone tools, uh, because these are not just art objects. To us in sociology, they are tools of power, quite literally. You will hear some about it. It's all about gender as well. It's about social stratification. It's also about world economy. Several years ago, I was asked, well, thanks you know, to Gega and his, uh, Dr. Maglobrishvili and his colleagues at uh, UAE National Defense College, I was asked to give a talk about UAE, the challenges of globalization and new technology. This is when I realized that, wait a minute, you know, the UAE, what later becomes the UAE, has been part of globalization at least for the last 4,000 years. And the new technology was actually massively coming from these shores, at least the copper, which was so necessary for Bronze Age technology. Uh, this is what inspired us. I'm very pleased you know, to see Dr. Robert Partizius here. Uh, I hope you know, to get you know, good, fruitful conversation out of this. And let me just introduce Ivan, Ivan Andreevich Samyan as, well, I first met him as a film star. As you can imagine, you know, that, and you can guess, you know, he had to play Vikings uh, there with a big <laughs> axe. Uh, oh, right. And uh, today we have a whole assortment of uh, very interesting archaeologists from Russia who are in Armenia, you may guess why. You know, so it's not only Ivan you know, who had the honor, I think in you know, a great luck of excavating in the Southern Urals, some of the earliest chariots, actually the earliest wheel with spikes known in the world, which could be that very prototype of Indo-European peoples you know, where they, they spread around finally. You can ask, one about this later. So we can have uh, we have Vitali Kraus here. You can guess, you know, that Vitali's name is uh, quite uh, ethnically German. Uh, and of course, you know, outside is our best stone napper around, uh, Nikolai Tsoi. If he doesn't look like us, uh, phenotypically, what you call it, you, know, you can guess. He's actually ethnic Korean, also a Russian, and here I am, an Armenian. You know why? Uh, we are all here. So Ivan is a great promise in archaeology. He had done already a lot. They have reconstructed those chariots. They tried them. And I hope that we could continue. So please welcome Ivan Semyan. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very, very pleased to see you here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, my name is, as you understand, is Ivan Simian. I'm archaeologist, I'm Bronze Age archaeologist, and also I'm an experimentalist. Uh, the experiments are designed to test our hypothesis in practice. Much of research, for example, in chemistry or physics is conducted in laboratories. Sociologists and anthropologists uh, can uh, provide those experiments in the field. But for us, it's uh, not longer observe the object of our research. We can see it in life. And when it, when it uh, needed, the experimental approach could help. We uh, may reproduce the ancient manufacturing processes, try to rebuild ancient buildings, and even retrace ancient journeys. Um, archaeological experiments allow us to gain new insights. This could be a great teach. Uh, teaching too, uh, to provide a wonderful illustration and uh, science popularization. Uh, that is what uh, we talked, what talk about today. Recently, I had the honor to be appointed the 
uh, director of the projected Archeo Park in Karmir Blur. It's not so far from here, it's uh, in Yerevan in Armenia. As many of you know, Armenia is in a, just a three hour flight from the UAE and it, it is even in the same time zone, so uh, you are, will be very welcome <laughs> in our Archeo Park. Karmir Blur means the Red Hill in Armenian language. It is red because in 585 BC, the formidable mud bricks uh, of the fortress of the god Teisheb, Teisheb and the fortress name is Teishibaini, uh, which once stood there, fell amidst a huge fire. The fire scorched the mud bricks and turned out them red. Uh, the fire also forever destroyed the Teishibaini which remained a huge pile of clay, of what you can call tel in Arabic, or uh, the, um, uh, in, a Turk, in a Turkish language, uh, we call it tepe. Today, um, it takes uh, the trained eyes of archaeologists to see the pile and of the ancient city and the temple structures or bazaars or towers. And um, let me tell you right up front how an archaeopark differs from the usual museum. This is a slide from uh, my previous experience uh, from one of the historical events. Here the bronze caster master uh, blow the fire in the furnace and the, this uh, little guy, this visitor, help him with the bellows to, to melt the bronze. In Archeo Park, you are not prohibited from touching the exhibits. Instead, you are encouraged to become part of it, perhaps even to get your hands dirty in a clay or some other material. Uh, we hope to help your imagination envision what the ancient archaeological sites looks in their heyday. Maybe even how they sounded and maybe even smell. Of course, within a reasonable and safe limits, which I sometimes not do for myself. <laughs> of course, within um, uh, of, of course, the uh, goals um, of uh, these goals are our goals are education and um, popularization, and I can say that we seek to recreate the living history. For example, one of the uh, recent prescient finds um, in the Karmir Blur. Uh, it is um, a flooring of basalt slabs and massive column bases. And uh, Dr. Mikhail Badalian, he present here, he excavated uh, this site. And sophisticated chemical analysis uh, showed us uh, that the floor was saturated with um, uh, pardon me, the uh, horse uh, hairs and urine, so the remnants of the horses and cattle. Uh, and could, be, it, could it be the royal stables? Uh, but then why um, we think about why it's outside of the palace walls, uh, and Dr. Badalian um, decided uh, that um, it could be the uh, ancient caravan sarai, the, the ancient uh, market. And even we can say that it's probably the, one of the earliest markets that known in the greater Middle East. Mm -hmm. Sorry? This is a plan of this object. Thank you. Our dreams, <clears throat> our dream um, is a, with the help of contemporary digital technology, we want to uh, recreate ancient fortress walls, temples, uh, bazaars, and especially in mobile electronic devices. Uh, point it to the side and see what it might look like near, nearly three millennium ago or four millennium ago. And here, um, this is a Good example from our experience. 
uh, reconstruction of archaeological heritage based on our excavation material from the Urals. You can see the excavations on the left side. We have created a virtually, uh, rea virtual reality model and then even a full-scale reconstruction in wood of the, uh, the, the reconstruction of the late Stone Age, Neolithic and Halcolithic uh, sanctuary. Uh, tonight, uh, the prominent Stone Age reenactor Nikolai Tsoi or Nick Tsoi, uh, he uh, show you our examples of our equipment, examples of our tools that we use in our experiments. Uh, let me show you a little uh, video of VR. So here you can see the 3D model after the leader scanning and uh, here in the winter the uh, full uh, scale model that we built with the uh, Stone Age tools. So a little, oh sorry, how to, I'll try to, okay. Um, so here you can see that uh, you can see the structures of the ancient object in the landscape and uh, visitor have some some tasks some ex exercises for example uh, find the pieces of the pottery stone age pottery and assemble the the ancient vessel and then when when the idol becomes satisfied by this he, he go away with all the all the structures. Um, of course, I'm not here to deny that reenacting history could be fun. Uh, here is how I met my wife on the Festival of Historical Films. Uh, our arrival uh, produced a funny commotion because we come to the, you know, the premiere of the film about the Stone Age with all of, of the Stone Age clothes and even the, with the bones and like this and people was very surprised. Um, it was a really authentic uh, clothes that we made by the, with the sinews and all, all of this. And this is how we, for example, raising our children, uh, just uh, also playing of course and play Need I remind you in here in new uh, way you uh, that it is a famous for um, um, its films and um, the theater programs, for example. Uh, play playing it's a crucial condition uh, for creativity and education. And some more about my family. Uh, my wife, uh, she's a historian of. Uh, uh, the costume, uh, she is an art historian and uh, here you, you can see my friends, the Nikolai Vitali, we have a, one big good uh, team uh, in historical reconstruction. Uh, now my wife is a museum curator and she is specializing in ancient clothes and um, she used to work in a, uh, as a fashion model in model agency, she have a big interest in costumes and more, even more in ancient costumes. Um, so, and I want to show you some example of, uh, sorry, of her work. I just don't see the, the arrow here. Да, подскажи, тут просто не видно стрелочку. Нажми на эту. Sorry, little technical problem. Как это? Я не вижу, видишь, стрелочку. А ее и нет. There are no arrows. Yeah, thank you. So it's a, just a very short video how my wife using fibers, natural fibers to make ropes and textile and we just go in for walk ne nearby our apartment in Armenia and she just maybe in 30 minutes do this rope from, from, the, uh, from the fiber. Do you realize the importance of fibers in human history? Uh, not just in dress, here is uh, how she is putting uh, f from the from the grapes, but this might seems to you um, maybe almost poetic, right? So, but 
think about it. Uh, the rope making, rope making uh, had an uh, important, um, important invention, uh, and uh, it is a big invent in human history. This skill does not come to us naturally. We are not genetically programmed to weave like spiders or birds making their nests. And here comes another major realization, uh, the gender, the gender role. Women made ropes and nets. This could be your salvation if men, uh, the hunter, uh, had bad luck in procuring big game like a moment, for example. Uh, then you could be survive with the catching of few rabbits, for example. Today, scholars believe that rope making is a plating net and uh, plating nets have become a crucial advantage of the early modern humans over the Neander Neanderthals. <clears throat> Last, but not the least, um, the newly invented skill uh, had to be taught uh, to other over the generations. Passing knowledge over the generation is called tradition. Uh, and so here we are, from the weaving to gender, from the skill transmission to the traditions. And all of these at the foundation of human culture. But our progress as a species was not always so placid. Uh, here is uh, our experiment. Uh, which I have conducted with my Greek colleague. This is archaeological material, reconstruction, and the testing of the uh, one of the most ancient Bronze Age composite bow, which w was excavated in the northern Kazakhstan and southern Europe. Our goal was to check what the earliest metal arrowheads used for. Did they appear as a means of defeating the enemy or for ritual display? After all, the new bronze looks so, you know, shiny, rich, and very impressive. And if it's a big <laughs> weapon, it's more impressive. <laughs> you can soon, you can, you can see. Uh, so, we bought a leg of, uh, of a lamb, wrapped it, uh, wrapped it uh, in a, one of the earliest uh, prototype that we made, prototype of uh, body armor, made from the uh, antler plates, elk antler, and uh, decayed remnants of such bows and body armor were found in uh, ancient burial mounds. We wanted to test the capabil capabilities of ancient attack weapons and protective gear, uh, because um, most part of um, archaeologists in post-Soviet space in Russia, they uh, believe that the earliest um, Bronze Age arrowheads that we know, they was just a ritual arrowheads. There are very few of them, so this is uh, like a evidence that it is ritual. Uh, and we want to, to see how it works. Okay, and let's see. This is, yeah, this is three of, three examples of very typical arrowheads for the, for the Northern Eurasia in the Bronze Age. This is uh, made from the bone, made from the bronze in the middle, and the made from the flint on the right side. And we make the test with a bow with a, of um, 15 pounds uh, power. And Vitaly, ты нужен мне? Sorry, it's a, some kind of ancient magic to make it life. Oh, thank you. Uh, so this is a uh, antler plates from the elk, and I use different examples of arrows. Uh, uh, really, I made uh, ten st ten strikes by everyone to statistics. But here are just three examples. First, the bone. Second, the flint, and the third is a bronze arrowhead. 
And the, finally, the result was that the bone example just flew off the shaft and a little bit crushed the plate, but not penetrate the aim. Uh, in the middle, the flint one destroyed the plate, but penetration, it was only 26 millimeters, it not only the all length of the, of the arrowhead. And on the right side, the bronze example destroyed the pl two plates and come inside on the more than 11 centimeters. So it's very lethal. And uh, we think that people invent the bronze arrowhead, firstly, uh, to strike the very early body armor because they, uh, the invention was in the same time. It's a very interesting moment. <clears throat> okay. So a bronze was the first, it's very important that the bronze totally changed the people's mind because uh, people, long time, most time of people history had a, a very natural mind, like a stone, we can say the stone age mind when the people was a part of the nature. But then bronze material changed the mind of people and people understand themselves separately from the animals. And it, because of the bronze is the first um, composite really first composite material. Against, um, uh, it very well work against, uh, for example, uh, very solid materials as um, uh, anther. Uh, bronze, it is a alloy about 90% uh, of copper. It is soft metal, uh, but n not so soft uh, as a, Copper. Um, when you adding the tin to the copper, it becomes more hard, more solid. And really, uh, ancient bronze is even harder than ancient iron. It just was uh, more expensive. So this is reason why people uh, invent the technology. One of the reason why people invent the uh, iron technology. Uh, as a former Saudi uh, Minister of Oil, Mr. Ahmed Zaki Yamani say, on a different occasion, the Stone Age ended not because stones have ended. The warriors armed with a bronze uh, weapon uh, had adventure, advantage over the tradition hunters uh, armed with the stone weapons. We have example of the stone uh, axe on Nikolai's table and uh, wooden clubs. Sometimes one must revise the oldest of tradition. In the consequential accident of geology, the natural deposits of copper and tin are almost never found in the same country. In fact, often quite far apart. Of course, you realize this means trade. As I uh, read um, in reports of my colleagues here, one of the earliest world, world exporters of the copper was the area around the Alain uh, in the United Arab Emirates. I previously worked in this, um, in this um, issue in Kazakhstan, in southern Urals. Um, it is another area very rich of copper in very far north, maybe the northern region, northern part of big uh, Bronze Age world. Here, it, uh, what uh, those ancient copper mines uh, look like in the Urals in the present day, it is a lot of, a lot of craters still a lot of craters and even some mines uh, looks very modern because they have a very deep, deep uh, mines, very deep holes. Um, how did this work? Simply enough, simple enough, um, if you uh, had what I'm going to show you. Um, this is um, malachite. Malachite is a um, semi-precious stone that's still using for the beads, for example, but it's a copper or it's oxidized copper. Uh, and people in the past using this, crush into the powder, then they put it inside the 
furnace uh, using leather bellows and take the copper ingots. Then they adding the tin in the copper and take these bronze weapon or bronze tools and this is exactly the type of arrowhead that we test in the previous video. Uh, um. The earliest centers of civilization had no communities. Mesopotamia or Indus Valley were rich in fertile silt and thus they could support many people who apparently all paid taxes. But to get vital copper, the vital copper, a uh, whole expedition had to send far and wide. Trade in commodities required transportation. This is apparently when camel was domesticated uh, somewhere around here and a horse was domesticated somewhere between the Don River and the Ural Mountains, where I come from. Here in UAE, you had some of the earliest sailboats. I admire the tremendous project of Professor Robert Partesios and his collaborators, who tried to rebuild one of those Bronze Age ships right here on this campus. Just for us, it's a very interesting project. In uh, our very cold sem semi-desert uh, and steppe around the Volga River and today's Kazakhstan, we also find stunning innovation closely related to the Bronze Age. I mean invented of the special light wheel and special horse harness, which called shield type cheek pieces. As an archaeologist, I want, want to mention it. Uh, wheels uh, had been known before, of course, but there were the slow, awkward, solid wheel like on this slide, like on the standard of four and uh, like on these uh, reconstructions. Uh, this is Sumerian battle wagon. By the way, notice that it was drawn into battle by the beasts looking suspiciously like donkeys. Horse was not yet domesticated, uh, or at least domesticated horse were not yet known in the Mesopotamia or India. The swift horse-driven driving chariots um, on spoked wheels would become the wonder weapon of its epoch. Epoch. Um, it is a 21st century high tech. Only the 21st century BC, of course. Now, okay. Uh, now imagine that the people who were the first in the world to figure out those chariots and trained horses also had a large supply of copper. Could this explain the sudden spread of Indian European people on the huge expanse from northern India to Greece all, all the way to the Celtic British Isles. Could it be uh, that they emerged from the metal rich Urals and Kazakhstan steppe also? Together with my friends and collaborators in our laboratory in a South Ural State University, we decided to test at least the technological side of this Indo European uh, hypothesis. Were their earliest chariots just for? display, ritual, or the funeral purposes? Or were they really the battle platforms for noble charioteers as depicted in the epic Mahabharata and Iliad? Nearly, or maybe more than two, more than two dozens of chariots were found in the like VIP burial mounds of the times between 21 and 18 centuries BC in the southern Urals. Uh, the radiocarbon analysis, more than 300 of uh, dates, confirmed the amazingly early period, amazingly early, early dates. Yes, there were the first uh, spoked wheels archaeologically known. I mean the wood remnants. Uh, badly decayed after so many millennia, 
yet still visible in some instances. So here you can see the remnants of the chariot horses, the shield type cheek pieces made from bone and antler. The, it is a, a special harness with the spokes that pushing on the cheeks of the horses. Uh, the uh, shape, the imprint of the chariot wheel with the spokes, one of them, of them and also the special uh, charioteer weapon as that axe, but many of uh, those axes have uh, the uh, blades on two sides. And also charioteers uh, had uh, bows with uh, quivers, with uh, different types of arrows, spears and other, other weaponry. But there remained many questions. Consider just two. Uh, the wheels came with the tires uh, made from cow skin and brightly uh, colored red, like in uh, Kazakhstan examples. Was this just for showing off? Or maybe for keeping the wheels dry and safe when, it not, when they not use them? The chariots somehow always had their axles broken. That could be simply because the weight of stones and earth crashed the objects buried underneath. Or this could be ritual damage. We know that the swords and spears and other weapons of dead chiefs were often uh, bent, apparently uh, symbolizing, uh, symbolizing uh, the end of their glorious career as a war and de death. The way to resolve uh, these disputes was by building a chariot, training horses, and then learning how to ride. And trust me, this is not so easy. Uh, together with my colleagues, together with my colleagues, we studied the archaeological prototype. Here, many prototypes, of course. Choose the best one with the best preservation and created an engineering solution for reconstruction. Then using the authentic material as um, wood, uh, leather, sinews, bone glue, because we don't, don't have any metal in the construction, just a wood. Um, <clears throat> we um, built a chariot and made an authentic harness. And we even made a harness with this Bronze Age tools, for example, we, I can say we forced our master to car carve, uh, carve these uh, um, plates, these uh, chick pieces from the horn but by the bronze, uh, bronze tools. It was very, very hard. We conducted various tests and measured the indicators of controllability, speed, and wear resistance. This is harness reconstructions. This is our field tests. This is measuring of turns. This is test of measuring. This is test of speed and controllability. And uh, we reached the speed near 45 kilometers per hour on this chariot. Um, we even have the big film about it. Um, <clears throat> so, let me show you some video. We uh, even one day we uh, try to test the all, all equipment replicas to, to see how it works in a, like in battle simulation. And a little, little video. Давай. Без курсора как-то странно. В середину, да, нужно поставить. Oh, this is a very short video. This is one of the tests. Uh, we buy two horses and trained near two years with them. I before that I have a riding experience as a rain actor, but it not helps me with a chariot. <laughs> It is in a, in a Uralic steps.
And the another problem was the horses was very scared by the motorcycle with the operator. It's the reason why we used drones to film. So in, in, here it's near 20 kilometers per, per hour. And now I just using my rails and start to ride on a high speed near 40 kilometers. Now, I think, yes. <coughs> okay. Um, so, um, what did we learn from the experiments with our chariot? First of all, thanks to measurements, we found out that uh, that type of harness with the shield type cheek pieces, uh, Sinamondo for archaeological artifacts, was needed for war or competitive races. And it is uh, absolutely useless for other purposes because you can't use it all day. The leather tires provide to be absolutely functional. They protected the wooden wheels from the small bumps and stones. Even the best uh, chariot wheels uh, crafted from the um, carefully bent oak lasted without tires for less than one season and the op on the open step. Still more th surprisingly, uh, the broken axles in fact provide to be semi-axles. They were bound together with leather strips and cautioned to ride on open landscapes. Uh, and I think it's a great feat of ancient engineering. What else are we planning now? Uh, look at on that mud bricks. This is a project where the Dr. Badalan invite uh, the Italian and French colleagues. And together with them, we hope to uh, rebuild at least a section of the wall of the ancient Teixibarini fortress. And mm, because not everything in the archaeological park could be, of course, virtual. A brick, it is a brick, and it's a kind of reality and m must have some heft. It's uh, worth noting that our colleague from France, uh, David Gandro and uh, Majid Hajmir Baba, they previously worked here in UAE uh, and uh, they reconstructed uh, the settlement of Hili, Al Hili. Uh, and mud brick may sound simple, but it needs special kind of clay and certain skills in drying and laying them. And it also hard labor. Each bricks weighed 54 kilograms. We need at least 10,000 of them to make the reconstruction, so please wish us a good luck. Uh, seriously speaking, we are welcome exchange. There is much to be learned from each other. We might be far away and uh, different, but uh, look, uh, your ancestors here found copper and in the hot desert. And our ancestors, they are mining copper in the cold steppe. It is a, like two most far regions of the Bronze Age world. And they interesting that they build the wells inside the houses uh, here because it is um, extremely heat in there because too cold in winter. It, it was only one possibility to take the water, not freezing water. Here they probably domesticated camels and on those region horses to control the space and using the space. In the process, whole landscape and societies were transformed. Studying the local archaeology of the Bronze Age, we uh, have prepared several archaeological reconstructions. Um, last um, year we reconstructed a uh, um, wool um, fabric material, a, a rich dagger, the, that, that dagger from the uh, very late Bronze Age, very early Iron Age, uh, and golden 
uh, okay, here, the golden pendant with the rams. Uh, these uh, very interesting steatite uh, beaker from the uh, telegraph. Oh, so from Hilly. It's from Hilly. Yes, it's from Hilly. And uh, these uh, this combs is from Telegraph. We uh, make replicas of, of two of them, the archaeological replicas. It was a very interesting experience because Nikolai, using authentic techniques, you know, the nothing modern tools, and it is difficult because, as you can see, Okay, as you can see, it's broken here in the middle. It is very, very difficult to produce, so it is, it is like kind of um, elite, elite stuff. So, and also, uh, I will show you, we make these, oh my God, sorry. Uh, we make this uh, stamp, also the, the Replica. Uh, it, it is interesting that uh, there's an imported Elam um, stamp. Um, so I'm so pleased that you come to my uh, to my speech, and uh, I be, was happy to show you the way how we teach and display in our projects and archaeoparks. Uh, thank you so much, and I will be glad to answer some questions. <laughs>